welcome to the first episode of the FNZ 90 plus free podcast where free football supporters take a look into the dressing room chatting to former professional footballers about their experiences on and off the pitch. I'm your host Ashley Simons. Tonight I'm joined by my esteemed colleagues Tux and Bex. Still trying to get used to that one lads. Um, You're yeah, going to have to mate. Here tonight. How are you doing boys? Yeah very well mate. Very good. Yeah good mate. Nervous? Apprehensive? Buzzing. Got John Slark. Um, you know, um, it's a little bit of I'm childhood here. You know, Soccer Saturdays for me has been a big part of my childhood, and seeing one of the it's a bit weird seeing John in his own home and not sort of on the terrace or with a nice stadium in the background. But yeah, 100%. looking forward to see what John's 100%. got to say. Uh, it's unbelievable, Jeff, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> 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 I'm sure this will be the first of many, but you have to start somewhere. In tonight's Series 1, Episode 1, we are joined by a former Premier League player who represented England no less than five times, a bona fide Crystal Palace legend, John Salago. John, welcome to the show, mate. An honorary member going forward into our Hall of Fame, I'm sure. How are you doing tonight? I'm very well. Thank you for having me on. Looking forward to it. Good to hear. Good to hear. Right, John. As is a new show, you won't be familiar with the format, so I'll give you a quick rundown of how it works. Just imagine you're in a pub with three complete random blokes, and for some strange, unapparent reason, you need to impress us with the best football stories you've got in the locker. Having played for the Eagles' uh, most successful side and having represented England as well as some other notable clubs, I'm sure you've got some absolute belters in the bag. Is that okay? Yeah, that's perfect. I do find myself in pubs talking to random strangers because we've got football in common to be honest though so exactly are we, allowed, are we allowed to swear by the way just moderately look you can you can swear all you like mate all right thank you we're not going to stop you <laughs> episode one guys remember that uh so brilliant right tux will kick us off with a question and we can go from there mate so tux take it away mate john yeah first and foremost thanks very much for uh, joining us um so before we get into your your career, um, obviously playing for like Palace and obviously an England international as well, um, I just want to sort of take it right back to the beginning. So obviously, you know, from a very sort of early stance from your childhood, you know, watching games, um, having that relationship maybe with your parents, taking you to games and things like that. I mean, just sort of take me through your early memories of, you know, going to football or watching it on TV. Um, my early memories, I've got um, two older brothers. And um, I think they took Liverpool, Man United. Um, and I ended up really just watching forward. Then when I used to play football, I always have to go and goal. They'd stick me in goal. So, you know, I would have to go and goal. But I just, I just loved it. Just we used to play football, and, you know, sort of morning, afternoon, night if we could. So the first game I ever went to was a 14-year-old. I went with the school, went to watch Arsenal at Highbury. Um, so I've always had a, sort of a deep affection for Arsenal ever since that. Although when I was a kid, I used to, Liverpool used to win everything. So I had a Liverpool bag and a Liverpool scarf. You know, typical kid. You just wanted to, you know, go along with, with um, you know, the, everyone else and wanted to be popular. So I wasn't, a, you know, I was never a football fan as such. I grew up in a little village, Westrom in Kent, school in Seven Oaks. So we didn't really have access to... My dad died when I was five. So unfortunately, I didn't have someone to take me. We didn't, we didn't really go to football. So watching that one game at Highbury was arguably the only football I watched live growing up as a kid and then the next time was going to those sort of places as a as a player. So you, you was obviously a, an Arsenal fan but with all the sort of Liverpool gear then, was that, is that right? Well, no, I mean, I, I just had this affection for Arsenal because obviously I saw my first game there. Um, but, um, you know, growing up, we all had a Liverpool scarf, a Liverpool bag because you didn't want to get beaten up you just wanted to be liked really. they were, you know everyone wants yeah. to follow a team that's like everyone's Man United weren't they the last 20 years and everyone's yeah. Man City and Chelsea you know it's like really you know Ibrahim Bish's money you know you know Mr Mubarak's money whatever he's you know the guy at Man City is um, you know so it, it's incredible really I mean the amount of Liverpool Man United fans that live in the south is, is kind of crazy really yeah. but obviously I, I got into Palace at 14 um, which is mad, really. So for, for me, I always describe it, Palace is home, Palace is family. I love Palace, Palace is home. Um, but Arsenal's like a gorgeous girl that I date and um, we go out. <laughs> but, you know, football's very cruel. Football is a very beautiful woman. I'm not sure she loves me that much. She treats me badly. But I keep going back to her because I love her so much. <laughs> So you obviously referenced a little bit about uh, your time at Palace there from quite a young age. Um, I mean, just sort of talk me through those sort of times. Obviously, it's probably a really successful time in your career. 
and obviously it's still a you know a youngster there as well. Um, you know, I'm sure that you know you talking about that now will obviously pick up some more questions that we've got for you. But I mean, just to start off with, I mean, take us through your time at Palace. I mean, there's there's games obviously the three three draw you know against United is obviously a bit of a standout game for everyone connected with that. Um, so yeah, just take us through your time at Palace. Yeah, so I joined at 14, signed apprentice at 16, uh, pro at 17. Uh, Richard Shaw's birthday was early and he signed as an 18-year-old. I was sort of six months younger than Richard. So but they, they signed me at the same time. So we joined and I went on loan to Swansea. And when I came back, it was that, that FA Cup season, 89, and sort of played that season. That was my breakthrough season. So we played Liverpool in the semi-final. So that, that semi-final at Villa Park was, you know, a defining moment for everyone. Um, Wright, he didn't play, he was injured. don't know if you remember, he fractured his leg. Yeah. And, uh, he sort of saw faith in to come back for the final. But that 4-3 at Villa Park was arguably the most exciting, most exhilarating, best game. They were like, they, they'd been the team of the 80s, hadn't they? They'd won, I think they'd won about seven titles during the 80s. They'd won everything. I went, they'd won the double the year before. We stopped them winning the double that year. And then we obviously played United in that final that was really a, a, a must win for Sir Alex Ferguson. And, you know, right, he comes off the bench, turns Palace, to scores that great goal. And then, you know, I sling in what was a lovely cross for him to score his second 3 <laughs> 2. Had to mention that. And, um, yeah. you yeah, know, we, forget we, that. we were six, seven minutes away from, you know, and Mark Hughes sort of slams one through O'Reilly's legs, through Nigel Martin's legs. and you know, it was just so weird. I just wish we'd have had extra time and penalties in that game. Just got it done on the Saturday. I think coming back on the Thursday was just really weird for everyone. And we played in that horrible yellow and black kit. I don't know if you remember it. Uh, but to kit. And it just never felt right. And, um, you know, that, that Thursday night was really weird. Surreal walking past that cup. And we'd come so close. And, you know, the year after, we bounced back. We, we finished third in, in, in the top flight. You know, we beat Everton in the Zenith Data Systems Cup 4-1, scored, scored at Wembley, head at the far post, past the big Nev- Neville Southall, which, you know, I'll treasure that, you know, goal at Wembley in the cup final. It, that, was a, that was special, really special. And, um, you know, that, that, that season, then I broke into the England side. Um, you know, just watching someone, you know, someone posted on Twitter, I scored a couple of nice goals in the last game against Man United at Sellers in that season. I think United had the cup final the week after. Um, and then, you know, I got, you know, as one of those stories goes, you know, I was, I was mowing the lawn, little lawn that I had, my little fly mow. And the missus shouts out, it's the England manager on the phone. And I was like, yeah, I'm taking the piss. I said, that's the lads messing around. I'm like, sure, is it? Yeah, all right, Jeff. Yeah, yeah Jeff. You know, I'll be like, is that you, John Pemberton? And he, was like, he was like, no, this is Graham Taylor, the England manager. I just want to <laughs> congratulate you. You've uh, made the, the, the squad for the um, tour of Australasia. I'm just like, <laughs> whoa, and that was that was a special moment. And then it sank in, you know, beginning to, began to sink in and monumental. Just the thought of, because I'd been, you know, you know, I'd, I'd got a call up. My dad was Nigerian. Uh, you know, I was born in Nigeria. My mum brought us back after he died. Um, so I qualified for Nigeria and so I could have played for Wales, Scotland or, or Northern Ireland. And my first call up was by Terry Orrith at Wales, which... Um, I turned down, then Nigeria knocked on the door, I turned it down, and I, I went to see Steve Coppel, and I said to Steve, I said, look, you know, I've had a couple of knocks on the door from Wales and, and Nigeria, and he said, well, what, what do you want to do? I said, well, I want to play for England, I'm, just, I'm, I'm, I'm English, and I want to play for England, that's my dream, and he just said to me, well, you're good enough, just wait, and, you know, Steve Coppel didn't say an awful lot, but that was, you know, that was Steve all over, and, you know, six months later, got my chance, um, so I went off to Australasia, played in that, you know, that tour, came back, absolutely flying, headlines. And then, you know, we were going to play, uh, it was a, a, a European um, qualifier. And Graham Taylor was there and I was, going to, I was going to move to Bari in the window. Um, and I can remember going to the game thinking, wow, everything's falling into place. This is happening. This is happening. And then... I actually just blew my knee that night against Leeds at Celeste and um, went to the hospital, came home and just looking at the stars at two o'clock in the morning thinking, went from world at your feet to everything in ruins. So that's just how life can go. Um, yeah. so. was, was that England call-up 
sort of a, a shock for you. Like looking at, back at that period for Palace, you know, you look at some of the players mm. in that team. You know, obviously Wright and Bright are the ones that stand out, but you, you're not far behind yourself than you know Nigel Martin's in there. Yeah. You look at players who are sort of sporadic. You know, did you sort of were you surprised to get that call up? Obviously, you said you thought Shawsy was winding you up, but you know, yeah. I think a lot of Palace fans would think you know you'd probably. Yeah, as a lot of players are now who are outside the top six, you know, why aren't they being called up? Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, it was a surprise, if I was being honest. I mean, because it was, we were, you know, we were Palace, but we, you know, when you finish third and we got to a cup final, we were making waves, we were, we were getting headlines. And, you know, I suppose that's just the modesty of it. You know, I think if we played for a big club, you know, people might talk in that, in that way, but no one ever spoke about playing for England. You just, yeah. it's not something that was part of, Although you dreamt it, although you thought it, you know, it wasn't something you openly sort of said or said out loud or talked about. So, as you say, Ian Wright, Jeff Thomas, you know, won't talk about Jeff's um, sort of chip against France that hit the corner flag. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, sort of, but Bright, he never, you know, played for England. Nigel Martin, you think that was a phenomenal, it was a fantastic side. Had a yeah. lot of um, talent. Eddie obviously played for, for ERA. Um, Eddie McGoldrick so you know it was um, it was incredible but we we were very driven that was a very fiercely competitive mm. tough dressing room and yeah. uh, we demanded of each other and you know I always say Ian Wright was just incredible with his desire with his energy um, you know he was just you know Ian would grab me you know he, he'd say right come on he'd point some crosses in he'd go, grab Richard Shaw right come and defend he grabbed Nigel Martin, right? Nigel going goal. And we just practiced. We just, you know, right, he would see a trick. You know, we'd watch football and we'd come in. Did you see that trick Ronaldo did? Or did you see what Rivaldo did? Or did you see what, you know, I'm not sure kids do that anymore. Um, you know, players do that. But we kind of lived it and we, we, yeah. we dreamt it. We were kind of caught up in that. And that was righty. And he, he dragged us and I was like that. We just loved it. We, we just worked yeah. so hard. And there's a, there's a lot of players from that team who have gone on, you know, into management. You look at sort of Alan Pardew, Chris Coleman, Ray Wilkins was around at that time, he's gone into coaching. You yeah. know, and obviously Gareth Southgate. Um, so, there was, yeah, so there was two sides, really. There was the, there was the first side, the Stevie Coppel, Wright and Bright, Jeff Thomas um, side. And then Wrighty went off to Arsenal. I remember that. It's a bit like when everyone remembers where they were when JFK got shot or... <laughs> You know, when Elvis died, it was when Wrighty left. <laughs> it was just such a shock. But he went off to Arsenal. Um, and, and when we came back, Mark Bright left, Jeff Thomas left. And it was just a change and there was a new team. So that, you know, it was Gareth Captain, you know, sort of Coleman Shaw, you know, Eric, um, sorry, Nigel Martin was still centre-half. And then you had Chris Armstrong. I mean, what a player yeah. he was, uh, Chris Armstrong. So Ricky Newman and that team. So we had a different side, but you're right. You know, sort of when you look back from the original side, you know, obviously Wright and Bright have gone on to sort of do uh, media. And then obviously Pardew, uh, I mean, I assume, you know, Jeff Thomas, what he's done with it, with his, you know, sort of foundation. Uh, he's been an absolute legend. Uh, you know, John Pemberton is, is, is had a career in coaching. Um, and obviously that other side of, of Southgate as England manager and Chris Collins had his, fantastic career as a, as a as Welsh manager as well so yeah some incredible strong characters that, it's the only one you sort of thought you, you know you said you've got a lot of strong characters and attitude in that dressing room is there anyone you thought maybe would have made a good manager but quite didn't get the crack apart from yourself obviously <laughs> <laughs> um I always thought I was going to be a manager actually just never got a chance um he said do you know what you never ever look across the dressing room and think wow um that person, I don't know, did, did we? I mean, Gareth, you know, just a real sensible, mature, fantastic yeah. lad, clever boy. Um, yeah, Because Gareth's, Gareth's sort of one you'd think, like, looking back, you know, with hindsight, you'd think, Gareth Southgate in those younger days, you would have thought, I can't really see it. An England manager is probably yeah. the last thing on anyone's mind, but, you know, he's done very well and, you know, yeah. been one of the, the better England managers we've had in the last, you know, yeah, exactly. since the millennium. Yeah, I mean, certainly, seriously, I mean, in honestly, when we were players, I mean, your Pardews, your Coleman's, you know, when, we, you know, after a game, you know, I can remember the lads, we'd, we'd go up, we'd be going to Manchester or Liverpool, wherever, on a, on a Friday afternoon, and there'd be people going, 
right, who's out on the Saturday? And I'd genuinely be like, well, I, can't, I don't want to talk about that. I don't know, because I'd see how the game goes. It was genuinely, if we won, you were buzzing. If you, if you lost, you just wanted to, to, to hide away and, you know, drown, you know, sort of bury your head and, and not, not do anything. Uh, and I genuinely felt like that. So, you know, that used to annoy me. They did that. And there was a lot of lads. You'd go for a drink after a game and I'd want to talk about the game. And, and the amount of times I went, oh, put the ball away, Sal. <laughs> Sal, you, shut up, you're boring now. You know? You know, and, it'd be, and to be honest, a lot of those players that used to say that were, were all managers now. Yeah. <laughs> they'd, uh, they'd all be drinking, it'd be, you know, be having a laugh and a joke. But, you know, as, as footballers, it, it's quite surprising, especially that era. We, players didn't really like talking about football. We didn't discuss tactics. We didn't really, we sort of went, we played hard, we played tough. And we won, we, we celebrated. There's a lot of players that, you know, had a drink anyway. You know, there was a culture there where you, you had three, four, five yeah. points after a game. You know, it was just part and parcel. Uh, I mean, the game changed massively. I can remember sort of probably that 92, 93, you know, sports science coming in the game, you know, nutrition was changing. The way we, in, in, and by sort of 90, you know, when your Vieras and your Ornrees came and your Zolas, you know, they didn't drink. You know, there was a, you know, I can remember lots of people talk about, you know, the foreign players and, you know, people going to play in Italy and the Italians would be thinking, has he got a drink problem? Because he, you know, Frey Wilkins, Tunis or David Platt or whoever you are, there's well, you know, if they wanted to cut the beers after a game, they were like, well, that doesn't happen. You know, we don't, we don't drink beer after a game, you know? Um, so there was a, there was very much a culture change in, in the late, you know, sort of towards the mid nineties, late nineties, when there was a lot of sports sides came, especially out of rugby. And sports scientists came into to football, and there was a change in psychology, you know. And, and, and even now, the game is just completely different from, a, you know, from that perspective. Yeah. Um, John, you said about putting the ball away, and obviously, um, you know that that phrase that comes with all footballers out, outside of the game. Um, mm. But if we look back at you know some of your better moments, you mentioned there about your your goal against Manchester United on the final day of the 91 season. Yeah, I two. mean, that was so, that, but that, that one you hit in the top stanchion, mate, was an absolute hit. Yeah. I mean, have you ever scored one better than that? No, do you know what? Some, as I say, I saw it recently and I hadn't seen it for a while and I was thinking the way you sort of swivel and, and smack, that was, yeah, even I was like that. Wow, that was, that was a bad time. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was pretty good. Um, yeah, no, that was right up there. I think I scored a really nice one against Man City. I stepped inside, right foot curler. But my, my favourite goal was the one I scored in the FA Cup against Nottingham Forest. Um, I think Mark Crossley sort of miskicked it. It came to me just inside the halfway line. I cut inside Roy Keane and then chipped Crossley from about 45. Yeah. You know, I thought I'd get away with about 48 yards. But, have you, have you uh, heard the story behind that? Oh, what happened in the changing room, in the yeah, forest changing room? Nice. Because I made Roy King's book. Cluffy smacks smacks him when he comes in the dress room for letting me cut inside. And um, I mean that that that's that's an achievement in itself. Scoring a goal so good that a manager had to clock his own player. Surely that's mm-hmm. got to be high, especially a player of Roy Keane's standard as well. With that sort of reputation. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it was phenomenal, really. I mean, I absolutely love Brian Clough, and, and and Brian Clough, you know, was just brilliant. And I think because after scoring that goal, I think he always sort of remembered me. So he always, you know, he always spoke to me, um, always said hello. And, you know, I can remember coming off once at half time at Sellers Park and he came off at half time. And, you know, it's just proud moments of putting his arm around my shoulder and just a well played son, well played. And you just think, that's right, club. Please, <laughs> please buy me. Buy me. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, yeah, some great special moments like that. And that, that was, um, Obviously, I mean, you know, sort of playing in the cup final against Sir Alex Ferguson, you know, again, you know, whenever I see Sir Alex, he sort of remembers remembers us from that final because it was so pivotal to his career because if he'd have lost that, he'd have got sacked and, and obviously he just flew from there. And obviously he still remembers, obviously, that team, you know, obviously with Wrighty and myself and, and whenever I see him in, in town or around, you know, maybe on, the, on in, with media, you know, he always says hello. And he's a brilliant man because he, he still remembers, like, my missus's names. He still remembers my kids' names. I'm like, how does he do that? It just, yeah. <laughs> so they're just, these, these people are just so special because you can imagine how many people they meet and how many people yeah. they come across and, and just to remember you. And, 
And that's one of the things that, you know, I love about football is when you see the proper people that, so there's a lot of people that are right up themselves in football and are very arrogant and, and very aloof, you know, but it's very nice when, you, you, you know, you meet Arsene Wenger and he's lovely and he speaks to you and you meet Sir Alex Ferguson, you meet some nice people in football that are nice. Mm. And, and that, that, that is something I love about football. There's things I don't, but there's a lot of, lot of good, fo- good people in football. And so, with, with Brian Clough, you obviously have a lot of respect for him. Um, you know, a lot of players have always said that he's the greatest manager that's never, mm. well, English manager that's never managed England. Um, so, would you, did you ever get the chance to possibly play under him or, you know, would you have liked to play under him? I'd love to play under him. Uh, he was just magical. I think he's one of those, those managers that just got the best out of you. He understood it. It was very simple. I think he was very clear. He understood the game. Um, him and Taylor worked brilliantly together. And, and to see the things he won and the, the, what he achieved, you know, even when he went to Derby with the Forest side. And that, that Forest side was phenomenal. You know, what, you know, we used to go there and you would, you would seriously, you had to give them respect. So like, Nottingham Forest are a big club. And even with his son, Nigel, with Des Walker, I mean, Gary Charles, arguably one of the best left right backs, Stuart Pearce and, and Keno in midfield and Chettle and, 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 and uh, you know, Franz Carr and Crosby. And then, you know, it, they had a phenomenal side. I can remember getting beat there 5-0 once, I think. And, and that was, we, we take that all day long. They, they just, the way they played football was, um, was a joy to watch and, and exactly the way it should be played. So he was, uh, yeah, definitely one that, um, you know, perhaps in modern times, I'd love to have seen Harry Redknapp manage England. Um, again, a man manager, proper football man, someone who understands people and the game and what it's all about and it means everything. So, you know, and, and that's what we love about it. So but Cluffy was a true, true great. So after your time with uh, Palace, you, well, most of your career, you stayed within sort of the London area, um, you know, sort of spells at Fulham, Charlton, Reading. Brentford. Um, I mean, sort of, t- take me through your career there. I, mean, I remember you at Coventry as well. Um, I'll just tell you a quick story. Um, obviously, when I left Palace, I had to fly back from holiday because Kevin Keegan wanted to take me to Newcastle. So I flew back and went up to Newcastle. And um, at the time, he wanted, they wanted to sign Ginola. Yeah. Ginola was asking for like 25 grand a week. And uh, he was asking for, the, you know, a lot of stuff. And so anyway, I think Kevin's it was the beginning of the end for Kevin in a lot of ways because there was a rumbling. He was in with, with Douglas Hall and there. there was Sir John Hall and, and I think McGinty or whoever the other guy was. And there was, so Kevin said, I'll go and get John Slarkin if you don't want to sign for me. Because that's what Kevin was like. Do you want to sign for me or not? There's the money. This is what I'm signing you for. And I think Joe Le, Ginola had bowled in with his agents and with his entourage and said, I want this, I want that. And he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's not how I, I work. So I went up there. Anyway, cut a long story short. In the end, they managed to do a deal with Janela and I ended up going back to Palace where, I don't know if you ever remember, Ron Nose put out a, a, a press uh, release saying that John didn't want to move as far north as Newcastle. And I got about 5,000 letters from George, irate George, <laughs> saying, what's wrong with Newcastle? Whereas I, I, I'd have walked up there to sign and I can remember just thinking, oh, this is my time, please, come on. And they had that side with Les Ferdinand, Rolf Fox, Ginola, you know, Albert. And, oh, what a side that was. So I ended up signing for Ron Atkinson at Coventry. Um, and that was a fantastic side, you know, with Dion Dublin, Gary McAllister came. You know, we had Grizovic and, and um, who else was there? There was uh, Unlove, I don't know if you remember him, Huckabee, yeah. Noel Whelan. We had a fantastic side, David Burrows, Brian Burrows at right back, you know, wonderful, brilliant dresser. And we stayed in the Premier League for three years. And that was, uh, you know, that was some, some achievement uh, back then for that, that, that squad and that team. Um, and a lot of those, yeah, the, 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 a lot of those boys went on to do well. Um, yeah, and then I left there and came, actually signed for Fulham with Kevin, Kevin Keegan, I uh, finally signed for him. And then went to Charlton with Kirby yeah, and two and a half good years there. Then um, in the Prem, I wasn't playing much. So, and then I ended up with Pardew at, at Reading. Um, and we had a lovely time there. Good side, got promotion. Uh, and that, then, you know, just 
sort of put the foundations in for that side that went on to to really do well with people like Stevie Hunt, Doyle, yeah. Marcus Hanneman, Ibrahim Sonko, Graham Murty, Nicky Shorey. Good, good side. Good, good players again. Harper, Sidwell. Um, yeah, a lot of fun. Good times. A lot, you know, really enjoyed my time at Reading. Loved that with Sir John Medeski. Um and then I, you know, left there and had one year with um, Martin Allen at Brentford, and that saw me off. And I was on the phone to Sky. I was like, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, Andy Melvin at Sky was great. He said, like, yeah, if you're ready, yeah. I went on and um, obviously, as you said about Sky Sports, and then you know, sort of settled in there as a as a what the fans used to call me around the country was a shit Chris Kamara. <laughs> <laughs> well, you go on, you talk about that, mate, and and working on Soccer Saturday. You know, it's it's probably the epitome of a Saturday afternoon. If you're at the pub, you're looking up at the screen, you're going to see Soccer Saturday. Just give us an idea of what it's like to work on a production like that. You, you know, look, I mean, I when I had my knee injuries, um, went back, you know, as I said, you, I went from the world, you know, was it, I was, you know, I had the world at my feet and I was going to go and play in Italy and earn lots of money and play for England and play in European Championships and World Cups. The next minute they're telling you your career's over. Um, you know, that's where I started thinking, I've got to do my coaching badges and I started doing television and you realise that you need to do stuff because your career might be over. And, you know, I was presenting goals on Sunday with Anna Walker and, you know, I absolutely love doing television and I was doing lots of stuff with Sky. And then, um, you know, when I, you know, when I finished playing, Andy Melvin said, you know, come and work for, for, for Gillette Soccer, which was the big show, wasn't it? It's the big iconic show. It had George Best on there, Rodney Marsh, didn't it? It had all the icons and, and Jeff's an absolute legend. And, you know, sort of going in the studio on a Saturday, uh, the only mistake I made was sort of the, the producer, Ian Condren, who came to me one week, he said, do you fancy going out on the road? And I was like, well, not really, but um, he said, yeah, it's good for you to sort of mix it up and get out on the road. And of course, the history. once I started going out on the road, I started going out on the road and obviously people like Charlie Nicholas and Merce and, and uh, Thompson and McAnally and, it's fierce, you know, they, don't get them wrong. Those boys, um, you know, they're, they're being, Gondra is there, they want to be in the studio, you know. So, you know, they, they fight for that. It's like being in a dressing room, I suppose, with Tizier. And, and you think about how many players, managers could be in that, yeah. in that setup. So it's very fiercely competitive. And um, But, you know, look, I ended up going on the road. I'd get in the studio every now and then on a Tuesday or a Wednesday, you know, cover games on a Sunday or Saturday. It was just, it was fantastic. You know, I didn't enjoy the travel too much. You know, I'd get in my car at sort of seven, eight, nine o'clock in the morning, drive up to Huddersfield or Blackpool or Barnsley or, you know, it, it was great. I mean, sometimes I'd leave my house at eight o'clock, I'd get to Huddersfield or, or somewhere like that or, you know, sort of Manchester at two o'clock, half two, I'd grab a team sheet, I'd be, you know, you'd be hurtling towards the gantry, you try and find the gantry, get up there, write your team out, get on there you know, literally put your headphones on and, you know, kick off and, you know, you'd be hoping Jeff doesn't come to you because you're still trying to work out who's playing where and, you know, trying to get your bearing. So, and that live TV, you know, that buzz is, uh, oh, brilliant. It was, um, it was fantastic. And, and you hear everything that's happening elsewhere and Cammy and McInally and Walshy and, and Cotty and whoever. So, you know, you'd get together for a beer every now and then. You didn't see him too often. You saw, you know, you saw the boys... Um, three or four times a year or if you saw him in the studio so but you were very much a team you're very much a family and great bunch of boys uh, but as you say it was it's the iconic TV football show isn't it and yeah. you know now I still watch it I you know if I'm at home I'll I'll, I'll sit and watch you know Jeff and the boys you know it, it's just in most places I go you know it's on so yeah Did you, did you find it hard, like, when you were sort of watching Palace, being a former player, sort of, you know, what, and you say, you know, Palace is where the heart, your heart is, it is your home. Do you find it hard to sort of, sort of switch off and maybe be a little bit more impartial and, you know, you want to be willing the boys on to do well and when yeah. you're sort of commentating on them? Do you know what was really special? And one thing I really appreciate, and I, 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 I need to thank the fans. When I, when I became a Sky you know, I say analyst, pundit or whatever it was, I worked for Sky. I became sort of more neutral. So I was sort of accepted around the country and the fans were brilliant with me. Although you get a bit of banter and 
they would, you know, they would, you know, obviously you go somewhere like Brighton, they're going to, they're going to hammer me, you yeah. know, they're going to give you, but it was all in good taste. It was nice. You know, they never yeah. really went too far and the fans were brilliant because you were quite neutral. And because I suppose, you know, Palace is a good club. Everyone sort of likes Palace. No one sort of dislikes Palace. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So there wasn't really, I didn't ever find there was any sort of aggression or real meanness to all. I always felt sort of welcome and liked wherever I went, which was, which was lovely. But obviously, you know, going back to your point, you know, if Palace were playing, or, you know, I always want, it's a result I always look out for first. Yeah. And, you know, I was wanting them to do well. And Palace are a team that go up and down. You know, I was yeah. there um, when we won the um, playoff final where Kevin Phillips scores the, um, the penalty, Zaha, you know, against Watford, which is when we came up last. And, you know, to stay up in the Premier League for the yeah. last seven years has just been absolutely incredible. I mean, just, you know, unprecedented. So, yeah. you know, it very much been a yo-yo side in the past. And I'll tell you what, by the skin of our teeth, how many times have we stayed? <laughs> Yeah. Say that well, honestly, Martin. Probably five out of the seven seasons has been like a proper cliffhanger, isn't it? So, where, where do you sort of see Palace going now? You know, like you said, they've been a bit of a yo yo club, but I think Roy came out recently saying, you know, they're going to need a little bit, you know, to change up their squad. And I think it's looking back, as bad as his tenure was under Frank de Bull, you know, that's something he tried to do. Um, but where do you sort of see Palace sort of taking that next step? They've had quite a few managers you know, in their time in the Premier League. And I think funds have sort of come into it. So where do they need to go to take that next step, do you feel? Well, I mean, if you look at it, you have your Holloways, your Pulis, your Allardyce, your, you know, your Pardews, you know, your Peter Taylors, your Bruce. Um, if you look at all those types, Roy Hodgson, they're very pragmatic, you know, just good, experienced English managers that yeah. play their, you know, four four two solid, start at the back, build a good defence, you know, hard to break down and, and um, counter-attack. So, you know, we try to get away from that. You know, we try to be more expansive and try and go to the next level with Frank. And he lost the first seven games with no yeah. goals. <laughs> yeah, no good start. You know, it's it? like, oh my God, oh my God. And it's like, but I always say, look, you've got to have serious money. You, ne- you need to have someone come in, you know, a billionaire, come and take a Chelsea or a West Ham or, you know, Palace look like a big side but we're not a, we're not a big side we're not a big club not a big infrastructure and they need a lot of money unless someone comes along and, and, and yeah. invests or injects a serious serious amount of money mm. Palace have, and again I say you know Palace are they're just completely overachieving yeah you know pal- massively massively overachieving and to be in the Premier League when you look at clubs like not be like Leeds and Nottingham yeah. Forest, and you know, you're looking at Aston Villas, and you look, there's some massive, massive clubs in the championship. Derby, you know, big, big clubs that have got real history and real pedigree. Um, yeah. So, you know, for me, just for Palace to be in the Premier League and to be competing and have, you know, all the big boys come in to sell us part, yeah. you know, and that's where the fans have this time round been serious, been an hour or half an hour away from going out of business. You know, when Steve Parrish and Martin Long and Steve Brown and the boys came along and rescued Palace. I think the fans have just embraced that and they've yeah. been absolutely incredible. They make, they are just like, we should be every day. You know, like if you wake up and you're healthy and your eyes work and your legs work and your mouth works and you think, you know, we should be sitting there just absolutely going, oh my God, this is the best day ever because we should treasure yeah. our health. You know, it's that kind of epiphany moment where you just, you know, they go to games and just love every game as if it was their last game. Yeah. The team, which is the way we should be in life but life doesn't let us do that life goes oh yeah we've had enough of that we want European football we want to finish higher we want to we want to sign Lionel Messi now we want more we want yeah. more. that expectation that fans bring is always amazes me <laughs> <laughs> fans just want more yeah I think that's, that's the life of football though I think it doesn't matter what club you support really I think you've got so many you know, so much expect, expectation that lies on either players' shoulders, mm. an owner's shoulders, a manager's shoulders. Yeah. But without that expectation, then sometimes I think, I don't know, maybe clubs don't really see the bigger picture sometimes. Um, and, you know, I suppose my point would be that if you look at a club like Palace, they've had, they, you know, they've been in the Premier League, you'd probably call them like a, a standard Premier League side now. But I think clubs like that, 
could probably go a bit further without spending money by just having like a, a good cup run or something like yeah. that. Um, you know, you're not going to pull up trees in the league, but you know, maybe something like well, a, a decent cup run would be would be good. You know, from your yeah. especially from your time there and going back to that sort of time that era. Absolutely. I mean, we we did. I mean, I was first team coach in the 15, 16 season um, where, you know, we were fifth in the league at Christmas and then Connor Wickham got injured. We lost uh, Chongy. Um, he went home. He had to go back to South Korea because he was having a baby. And we and then Balassi got injured. That was it. And and we couldn't win a league game after that. But we went on this cup run. Yeah. You know, we, you know we, we beat Southampton, you know, went and beat Spurs and... You know, then we beat Watford in the in the, court, in the in the semi-final at Wembley, and then and then narrowly lost well, to bloody Man United again. <laughs> <laughs> so well, I was convinced. You know, like I remember we were at the hotel, we were you know the Grove, we were staying there for two or three nights, and I was playing table tennis with Adi Bayor and the boys. And, you know, I was convinced after that 1990 Cup final, you know that replay, I was convinced this was our time we were going to yeah. get. You know. Van Gaal was like leaving, wasn't he? They were in turmoil. Yeah. Wayne Rooney didn't really want to play. Matter was all over. The, you know, you know. I think he brought back. Um, uh, what's it not? Um, not for, for the main. What's his name? What's the tall guy with the big Fellaini. hair? Fellaini. 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 Yeah, we didn't know Fellaini was going to play. They, you know, it was. They were. They weren't fluid. Um, no. They weren't playing at their best, and I just thought the timing was right to get our revenge back on Man United. <laughs> yeah, and to get you uh, one 0 up, and sadly uh, that final's rem- you know rem- remembered for um, yeah. Pardew and his dancing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Seriously, he cost us. He, he what? I, I, I still don't know what, what the hell he was thinking of, but <laughs> it all got it had all gone according to plan. It was perfect. It was a scrappy game. Stay in the game. Punch comes on, disappointed not to be playing, but he does exactly what every player should do. Go and, you know, go and fight, go and stand up on the stage and be the best you can. Yeah. Scores a great goal, one nil up, you know, sort of 72, 74 minutes. We're like, come on. And then yeah. the jig. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> so, John, it's, it's fair to say you've had your fair share of uh, football memories, either as a player or a fan, but... Who would you say is the best player you've ever played with or against on a football pitch? Yeah, I get asked that a lot. And it's, you know what I mean? For me, it's so, so easy. I mean, I absolutely love Wrighty. Wrighty's my man. Club, club player, Ian Wright. Phenomenal. Um, at, at England level, just Paul Gascoigne was on a different level. He was just training and, you know, play. he was just on a different planet. The boy was, was phenomenal. Um, you know, sort of playing against, playing against, I was lucky enough to play against a unified German side at Wembley and, and just being up close with Lothar Mateus was like, oh, whoa, that's what it's all about. But, uh, you know, my favourite player of all time is, is Thierry Henry. Um, just, you know, players like that, when you see them and you're lucky enough to, to, to be on the same pitch as them, is just, I mean, someone like Cantona, I mean, I was there that night, Cantona did that Kung Fu kick, but, he had he had something about him. Players, you know, when you see people like Jan Frank, Jan Franco Zola, um, there were so many good players. And, and you know, you, you, perhaps I am of that era, but I genuinely think, you know, sort of 15, 20 years ago, you know, Glenn Hoddle, you know, Glenn Hoddle was just so good. He was so good. You know, grew up and you see you see them even when they were getting a bit older. They just had everything. Glenn on two feet and... You know, but you know, football for me was it just was different then. It's a different kind of game now. Where yeah. um, when you play up against people like Kanchelskis and Overmars and Dennis Burkamp, I mean Dennis Burkamp, jeez, wow. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going Arsenal. I mean, Sol Campbell, Vieira, Henri <laughs> <laughs> Burkamp, right? Cole. I'm not. I'm a bit Arsenal biased, I suppose. But um, yeah, no. I mean, for me, you know. Omri, Zola, um, well, you know, people like Kanchelskis were just, I mean, Paul Scholes, geez, I mean, too many. I mean, I'm just... Yeah, you know, you could, you could, we could go on all night, I think. Yeah. But great me, players we've had. Yeah, Gaza, Gaza was just so good. Flor, you know, Flor, I saw him not long ago, we did a dinner together, and, you know, the lads, look, he, he looks well, but Floor genius. I mean, he was absolute genius, absolute genius. And Wrighty is just, you know... The, you know, I'm not surprised he went on to do what he did at Arsenal, but even when he was playing with us, you just thought, 
the lad is destined for great things. Yeah. I just want to know one thing because you just touched upon it there with uh, your time at Palace with the Eric Cantona thing with the Kung Fu kick. I mean, what what was your reaction? I mean, you know, we've never seen anything like that again in football, and we didn't really see that before. But mm. what was your reaction as a player on the pitch, just just looking at that from a, a bystander's point point of view? Yeah. I mean, probably. I mean, Eric Dyer's little jump into the crowd and running yeah. up the stand was was the first time I went. Wow, you haven't seen anyone do crazy stuff. Yeah. On. It was nuts because we we were doing a man to man marketing system. So Shawsy was marketing. We used to call Shawsy the rash. I mean, he he was just the best man. Man, so I mean, Kant and I just got frustrated and kicked him up the arse, and he got sent off. And he, he's walking off, and we're giggling. We're like, right, job done. He's off. Because it's like, lose your head, lose the game. I mean, that was, you know, that was the plan. We weren't trying to be, that was part and parcel of stopping the opposition. But he's just walking off. We just saw him do this. this that lad comes down and then next minute he's, he, he sort of goes to come through and slides along the railing. And then Chris Armstrong sort of goes. And we sort of, we're just, you're, just, you're just thinking, what just happened? Because yeah. he's the biggest player, arguably in the world. Man United, <laughs> biggest player, biggest club. And we went in the dressing room and, and Alan Smith, the manager at the time, just said, listen, don't talk about it. Don't speak to the press. Uh, it's nothing you say. Let it take its course. You know, I'm sure the, the FA will deal with it. And um, that was it, really. But, you know, sat in that dressing room, sure, you know, Gareth Southgate and uh, Shawsy Coleman, you know, all the lads that played that night, we sat in the dressing room just thinking, just couldn't believe it. Just thought, wow. And then, obviously, the next day, it all unfolds and... Obviously, it was when the seagulls fall as you throw a leur. Um, what, what do you think he meant by that? What, what, or was it, is it just Eric Cantona in general? I mean, it was, <laughs> I, I, th- I think he was at the biggest club in the world. I think all the press followed him and they were looking for a story. You know, he'd given them a story to write. And they were the, you know, they were the seagulls just, you know, waiting to, to pick off the scraps of, of yeah. what he left behind. So... You know, it was very much, you know, the press hounded him. You know, he was nearly enigmatic, wasn't he? He was a, such a different kind of character. It, you know, it's almost like aliens had put him on the, pl- uh, you know, come and put yeah. him in England. It, it's a crazy story, really. He got thrown out of French football, hadn't he? And then he comes to Leeds and he, and then obviously, you know, he extracts Ferguson and picks him up for a million pounds and turns him into this iconic, incredible character that just could, could tr- it transforms Man United into this, team that with these youngsters and it was it was amazing it's just yeah. I mean it's just a story I mean that will be a, be a documentary I don't know if it's out at the moment but he's gone on to be a you know sort of like a, a film star isn't he and, and doing stuff so he's an incredible character yeah a, a cult hero of of, uh, of sorts really um, yeah. if you look back at him but John we're coming to the end of this tonight and I just wanted to to uh, to thank you for coming on. Firstly, this is the first show of this series. Um, you know, we're trying to get out there, rebrand ourselves, and go going forward. This is a I've really enjoyed this conversation tonight. But I want to ask you one question. We've got an aim on this channel to get one player on, someone who really, really does tick all the boxes in terms of we want to know what happened to this guy. Do you know Delhi Adebola? Delhi Adebola, no. Um... Oh, jo- oh. All right, John, you let us down there, mate. <laughs> Very, yeah, because he um he signed for Palace, didn't he? Uh, yeah, did he did. The Palace he did. for quite good money. Like him and Akin Bai were like five million pound buys, weren't they? Yeah, yeah that's right. Absolute disasters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, before he does eventually come on here, that he doesn't hear what you have to think about him, John. Who's the other one? <laughs> Chef Dikuchi, was it? Chef Dikuchi. Oh, yeah. oh what a hero. I think he came for five million as well. Another disaster. Oh, uh, oh, look, John, we, we, we're not really going to go on this about this much, but all three of us are Ipswich fans, and we absolutely adore Chef Dikuchi. Right. <laughs> did he, did he, he play for you first, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Brilliant player. He absolutely. He just didn't happen for him at Palace, but yeah, no, what a beast! He was an absolute bull and a beast of a man, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. Yeah, no, fair enough. Yeah. Not all good players, to be fair. They just didn't. I, I think they just. Didn't. They all have the time, don't they? You all yeah, have the time to clubs, head. don't you? Yeah. Remember, it didn't really work out that well at Palace, but all top yeah. top players and had great yeah. careers. So, absolute pleasure talking to you guys. And um, a bit slow with the beer coming through, but it was good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, where is the beer? You know, we get Mark uh, Tux has been on the recruitment all week. I think I'll put Bex on the beer next week because uh, yeah. by name, by nature. Yeah, exactly. It's in, the, in the family. 
Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> John, John Salako, thanks for coming on tonight, mate. It means yeah. absolutely well to so us. Much, mate. And make sure, if you listen to this, make sure you give it a five star and hit subscribe. But until next time. Oh, 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 oh,